Her Majesty's Australian ship Diamantina was the Navy's grand old lady. In 35 years of outstanding service, she's fought the Japanese, explored the oceans, and given young sailors their first taste of life at sea. She's endeared herself to everyone who sailed on her, and now she's about to make her final voyage. The last of Australia's steam-driven river-class frigates is going home to Queensland, where she was born. The Diamantina's last destination is the dry dock at South Brisbane, where she was prepared for war. For a hundred years, the dry dock was the mainstay of Queensland shipping. Today, it's the home of the Queensland Maritime Museum and Diamantina's last resting place. The museum reflects the pride and care of the enthusiasts who run it. It glows with polished brass and the history of the sea and steam. For a proud old lady like Diamantina, a fitting home. Waiting to keep an appointment with Diamantina is the old steam tug forceful, lovingly restored and operated by museum members, and until now, the centre of their affection. For more than 50 years, she worked the Brisbane River. She was retired to the museum's care, and soon, she'll have a sister. Below decks, forceful as an example of the efforts of the museum and its volunteers, true to the original in every detail. She's been maintained in working order, and today, she runs more smoothly than ever. Museum's people are dedicated to their task. They enjoy getting dirty. They love the heat, the hard work, and the noise that accompany their pastime. Above all, their passion is steam and steam engines. For them, the chance to restore and preserve vessels like Forceful and Diamantina is an irresistible challenge. At the end of her naval career, Diamantina prepares to begin a new life, and the museum's plan to bring her home from Sydney is yet another campaign in her chequered career, one that will leave a mark on all she touches. The preservation of a historic warship, which isn't too big, and perhaps will not be beyond people's uh, resources, is an excellent idea, and it's something which uh, preserves a part of our national heritage. And you gentlemen and ladies all have all got a great part to play in it. And uh, we wish you bon voyage. And when you get to the far end, of course, there'll be the great reception. And the minister will, of course, be heading the ship home. And I'm just here today to wish you bon voyage from the Navy at this end. In a break with tradition, a paid off naval vessel will leave on her last voyage under her own steam with a crew of civilians. The captain the chef, the ship's doctor, the quartermaster, the helmsman, and even the radio operator. All are enthusiasts from the museum with proven skills. But Diamantina is a warship, and as backup, 12 of the ship's naval crew will accompany them as volunteers. Until she reaches Brisbane in three and a half days' time, enthusiast and professional will work side by side. In contrast to forceful, Diamantina burns oil. But the principles are the same. Fire, water and steam equal romance and adventure.
The engines that drove her in war will drive her just as reliably today. Their creaks and groans will disappear as they warm and the oil circulates. A piece of history is coming back to life. Bridge! Ready to go. Ready to go. Bay telegraph. Bay telegraph. Well out. Well out. Starboard tender. Starboard tender. Naval tradition dictates that retired ships are towed through the heads to the breaking down yards or to be sunk. But Diamantina has won a reprieve, and as she heads to sea, it could well be just another exercise. The 91 metre frigate was built as part of the all out effort to boost our naval strength after the Japanese declared war. While her keel was being laid down in Meriburra, Rod McLeod was one of the kids clambering around Walker's shipyard after school. He saw Diamantina and her sister frigates sail off to battle. Today, as president of the Maritime Museum, Dr McLeod's love of ships is greater than ever, and he's been at the front of the fight to save the Diamantina. Uh, both of are going engineering. Oh, well. like a willow sewing machine, you know? Right, see you later. Hello, Arthur. Now, I've just been doing the rounds down the cool rooms, etc. The cold room's not as low down on temperatures as I'd like it to be, but it seems all right, and the meat will hold up for the next two days. People from all walks of life are museum members. Quartermaster Arthur Tillett is a retired bank officer. They've worked as a team and share a great sense of victory. It was a, a strange feeling of elation, worry and many things when we were sailing from Sydney at that magnificent farewell. It's been the result of five years of hard work and it's the planning's worked out, we've had the help and also the luck I dare say of getting the ship and I think it's tremendous. I can understand about the elation, why do you say worry as well? Well, we've taken on a very big project. We understand just how big it is, but we, while I know we'll do it, you do feel, well, now that we've really got to get in and keep this job going. What are you going to do when you finally get it to Brisbane? Well, she'll lay up at the wharf for a short time until she's ready to go into South Brisbane dry dock. The dock has to be prepared fully yet. And then we've got a lot of alteration to do. Now, right behind us over here, towards the stern of the ship, you can see those large houses which were used during the research phase that the ship's been in. She's worked very hard over the years. Those things, for instance, must be removed. We want to return her more towards a World War II configuration. Now that means getting them off, many other alterations, acquiring armament suitable for the ship, and putting that on as well. There's some talk around the ship about trying to keep her in the water. Is that a possibility? Oh no, that's totally impossible. Why that? Well, do you realise that we've just checked out 24-hour steaming 
at rate of using fuel, and it's exactly what we anticipated, it's nearly $6,000 worth. I'd love to just say, right, let's go on for another 10 days up to the reef. It's such a wonderful steaming day, the ship's running so perfectly. But costs won't work that way, museums can't work that way, you can't preserve a ship afloat. There's too much problem with rust and deterioration, she's just got to go into that dry dock. Under full steam in battle, the Diamantina could manage 19 knots, but the speed on the trip home is a more leisurely 12. Nevertheless, her crew maintain rigid four hour watches. To most people, the constant heat and noise would be unbearable. But to men of steam, it's all part of the magic. Well, I feel as I did the first time I was ever on board a ship of this type. The uh, thrills never left me. It's something that's come to me all my life. There's something animated about these engines. There's something moves and you feel part of it. The, um, piston rods and the connecting rods whirling around, you've got a sense of urgency, but you're getting somewhere. You can see all this action going on, you feel part of it, it instills a sense of uh, excitement. To Norm and other marine engineers, Diamantina is a thoroughbred among steamships. The fine engines, the product of 160 years of ingenuity which modern technology would be hard-pressed to improve upon. She's inherited the very best refinements from a number of historical characters. James Stevenson, a couple of Parsons, and a certain single-minded Mr Yarrow. The story goes that Mr Yarrow, a famous engineer, was on his honeymoon on a ship with four similar uh, crankshaft, and the vibration was so bad that he spent most of his honeymoon pondering the question of vibration. Really? And uh, yes, he, um, he developed a formula which in conjunction with his partners when he got back from his honeymoon, uh, they developed and uh, this formula for a balanced crankshaft is still in use today. In fact, the Diamantina is an example. So it really was a romance? Oh yes, too. yes. Yeah, romance in more ways than one. Midships. Midship, sir. There's a big difference between steering a naval vessel and a conventional one. In the merchant service, the helmsman can usually see where he's going. On a naval vessel, it's a matter of following bearings from the bridge because the wheelhouse is built below. Oblivious to danger, the helmsman must blindly follow his compass, even to the point of ramming another vessel if the captain so orders. It's a matter of realising that the compass uh, remains still and the ship moves. Uh, you've got to uh, learn to bring the ship's head round to the ferry. I imagine it's harder than it looks. It takes practice. Uh, I'm fortunate that I was able to gather a lot of practice. I was in the Navy in, uh, in 42, I left in 46. It's a long time ago. Uh, I have been associated with the sea since then, and uh, it's it's something that I like doing. I'm sure to get it. Starboard tenter. I never steered the Diamond Tina itself, but it's fantastic to be on board a naval vessel like this. It's like stepping back into the past, and uh, also to be able to help preserve a ship, a ship of this type. I feel it's terrific. It's it really really is something. Steady, zero, four, two. How long since I ste first steered a ship like this? I uh, steered one a bit smaller than this when I was 16. And I'm 55 now. It's a long time ago. It's a long time ago. Too darn long. Good to be back at the wheel. It is good to be back at the wheel. It's good to know that I can still do it.
Diamond Center, Sydney Radio, Romeo, uh, all times in the text now, Greenwich Mean Time. You mentioned the call sign, Victor Mike Foxtrot Bravo, and also Victor Lima 6999. Uh, is VMSB another one of your call signs, Evan? Uh, this is Diamond Ten. Uh, that was the original call sign of the ship. Uh, Victor Lima 69999 uh, has been uh, issued to us for this voyage to Brisbane, have right? Ah, Romeo, I don't understand now, that's all right, okay. Uh, there's a little bit of feedback getting in your signal there, there's nothing really to worry about, but uh, I thought I might tell you about it. No other ship knows Australia's seas and oceans better than the Diamantina. As an oceanographic research vessel, she steamed 800,000 kilometres, exploring and charting their depths. An almost bottomless chasm in the Indian Ocean is named after her, the Diamantina Deep. Change of watch, sir. Very good. Peter Cook Russell looks upon his years as commander of Diamantina as the best he spent in the Royal Australian Navy. He was still a commander when she was paid off a year ago. But today, he must take a back seat because she's no longer a naval vessel. He's happy, though, to take his turn at keeping watch along with the others. At sea, old loyalties die hard. Captain to bridge. Smoking captain, now I've been five miles, sir. Very good, thank you. What's the weather like up there now? A strong wind warning has been cancelled, and it's north. Captain Fenton McLeod has been at sea even longer than the ship that's in his charge. For 45 years, he sailed the world in the Merchant Navy. When he retired, he joined the Museum Association to keep some contact with the sea. So when the job came up. The old merchant seaman was a natural to captain the Diamantina on her last voyage. A task that's fulfilled a very old dream. Oh, it's been a wonderful experience for me and I'm uh, very proud to have had the opportunity to bring the ship up. It's been a long ambition, I understand, to, to be in charge of a naval vessel. Yes, it has. Uh, I suppose you could take it right back to the time when I first tried to join the Navy. How long ago was that? I'm not telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a long time ago, but uh, unfortunately I was the also ran. So you didn't get in the Navy I then? didn't get in the Navy, and then a couple of years after that I went into the Merchant Service and stayed there all my career. And now um, you've eventually made it? <laughs> I eventually made it after many, many years. <laughs> Soon, Diamantina will enter Moreton Bay and the pilot will take over. Then, it's home for good. But first, there's a visitor to be welcomed aboard. For him too, it's the most important day since she was commissioned. Morrie Rose was her first commanding officer. Five years' service in the North Atlantic with the British Navy had made him a hardened seaman familiar with the challenges and dangers of war at sea. But the Diamantina left a mark on him too. Hey, we're going to I usually get aboard this way. No bloody pipes either. <laughs> 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 Don't they? What a surprise to see you too. I didn't know the last night it was you who was coming on board. What a marvellous reunion. Commander Rose, what's it like to be back on the Diamond again? Oh, lovely. Especially with this bloke too. We served together in the North Atlantic. I suppose it brings back old memories, eh? Oh, yes. Very much so. Chris? Do you know Commander Morris Rose? No. Welcome aboard, sir. Back to your old ship, I believe. Yes, yes. Well, that's a bit difficult. Here on the bridge is the first change he'll notice. When she steamed off to war, there was only a canvas canopy, making it the most dangerous place on board. I uh, well remember the day when the ship was commissioned in Queensland, in Harvey Bay. I see now that the ship is flying the Red Ensign. 
and as the ship was sailed down the Mary River from the builders, she was flying the red ensign. And it wasn't until the next morning at eight o'clock that I commissioned the ship into the Royal Australian Navy and we then hoisted the white ensign. Uh, we had altogether, in addition to myself, 160. So we had quite a big ship company. And what kind of artillery would you have had on in those days? We had a main armament, two four-inch guns, one just where we are now standing and one up forward. And with those guns we carried out our several bombardments of the Japanese. The gunners had not fired many shots in anger when the Japanese began to surrender en masse. At places like Ocean Island, she became an agent of peace and Murray Rose remembers every detail. The actual surrender ceremonies themselves probably didn't take more than about 15 minutes, but uh, the, the whole episode was of great interest to us. We set up a table just down here, put a green tablecloth over the lot. There was a bit of wind, so we held it down with the uh, weights and set up chairs on each side of it. Brigadier J.R. Stevenson was the officer appointed to take the surrender on behalf of uh, General MacArthur. I sat on his right hand side as the official representative of the Australian Navy and opposite us sat the Japanese. The terms of surrender were read out by Brigadier Stevenson in English interpreted by an Air Force officer who understood Japanese. The senior Japanese officer then signed the instrument. It was handed over the table to Brigadier Stevenson and he then countersigned it. Can you describe what the feeling was like at that surrender? The feeling of the ship's company, you mean? Oh. I suppose I can only describe it in the way that it really affected myself. I was uh, very glad that everything was over. I'd had over uh, well, just, just on six years continuous active service and I was very glad to find it was all finished and that we had won. I had no doubt whatsoever that we were going to win. Uh, I was a bit surprised earlier in the year to find that the end of the war was coming a bit closer than I had really anticipated. but. Uh, Generally, I'd say we were all relieved that it was over.
HMA of Diamond Tina will be handed over to the Queensland Maritime Museum at noon today by Defence Minister Jim Killen. But as the fine old lady of the sea comes up the river, she's expected to be greeted by thousands along the banks getting a glimpse of a piece of history, a final voyage. A moment ago I spoke to the captain, Captain McLeod, on the Diamond Tina. He says they're getting ready now to steam up the Brisbane River. It's always sad to see a ship finish, but this one fortunately is not going to the breakers. It's going to be preserved, and uh, that I think is a very good thing. A ship with a little bit of history behind her. Uh, we have the first commanding officer of this ship on board at the moment, and also the last commanding officer for when she was serving as a naval vessel. Commander Rose, the Diamantina's last voyage. Yes, it is, and I'm very proud to be aboard her at this time. And I'm thrilled to see such a reception from all the uh, boats and all the enthusiasts who are apparently uh, just as glad as I am to see the ship coming back. And to think that she's going to be preserved here in Queensland, I think is a, a great tribute to the state which built her. And the, state whose workmen and craftsmen put their skill into the making of this ship. Tina.